Well, good afternoon. Welcome to class time at Central. My name's Robert. I'm one of the adult teachers here at Central Church. I hope you're doing well. Hope your day is going well and your week is going well. I'm um, in letting you know you should have heard or probably have heard by now, by the time you actually see this, that we are examining the possibility of reopening classes on Sunday uh, in person. Uh, not, I am sure not every class will be available, but we want to get as many as possible um, considering the restrictions, um, trying to make sure that every age, large age group is covered uh, and the like. You should have seen an email or a request by now. Uh, if you get it, re please respond. And it is seeking out those who were teachers uh, prior to COVID, uh, the time we shut down. Uh, would you be willing, under these conditions, to come back and teach? If the answer is no, then the answer is no, and that's all right. And the other question would be, if you are not a teacher but you or you have children, would you be willing to, to attend in that class uh, if it were to be reopened? given certain conditions and again, once again there's no right or wrong answer uh, the, I say the only wrong answer is a false answer you know as long as it's true then just state it we'll try to see if there is an interest in in those classes being offered live but either way this class will continue to be streamed uh, I may resort back to or I guess revert back to a live stream. Uh, when we taught the parables, that was a live. I was actually here at 9 in the morning on Sunday uh, producing that class. Uh, since then, it's been recorded. Today is actually Thursday for me at the recording, and it's made available usually Saturday afternoon to Saturday evening, and will stay available. Whatever way it chosen by those who are working this issue, um, this class will be available still either way. Uh, either I do it live and record it at the same time for a live class, or I still pre-record it. So we'll do it that way. As such, I am curious or hesitant to start a, any sort of a long class series, liking to know exactly uh, to the best I can who is in my class, at any given time. Uh, so until then, uh, when th those decisions are made, I'll, I'll jump around from topic to topic as something that's either on my mind or if you have something on your mind, feel free to send it to me. I'd be glad to look at it. So if you would, like I said, make sure you, if you can respond to that uh, request and give us an answer and so we can decide what to, what to do. Like I said just a minute ago, it is Thursday, it's September the 10th. Happy birthday to my mother. Um, and tomorrow is September the 11th, um, 9 one, one And it's hard to me to imagine that it's been 19 years since that. Um, a whole generation. Uh, is alive today that has no recollection of that event happening. It is fresh in my mind as it happened this morning. Uh, I'm sure for a lot of you who, who were there, it's fresh in your mind too. And it's just amazing, um, you know, at the time uh, when it happened, 2001, I was traveling quite a bit and um, in Washington quite a bit of those travels and I recall that before 9-11 um, travel in an airplane was grumpy um, people in angst pushy stressed you know if they can cut in front of you they will it just everyone it was just it was just hectic and I remember on 9-11 and 9-12 and the days after, 
thinking, you know, I was really fortunate not to be caught on travel. Because uh, as you recall, the airport stayed closed for several days. And the one that I often flew to, Washington Reagan National, stayed closed several more weeks. Um, it had been a hitchhike or a catch a cab or some other way home. And I remember that after that event, um, when they reopened the airports, I traveled pretty soon afterwards, that everyone was quite agreeable. No complaining about seats, uh, no complaining about delays. Um, <laughs> sure, do you want to search me? Sure, make have a great time. You know, it's Painting our bags as we even entered the, the plane to be searched, it was it was certainly different. And yet, with all those delays, uh, no one seemed even more agitated. Uh, they were much more congenial, myself probably being one of them. And there was a certain civility uh, that existed in those days following. And we thought, oh, the times have changed. This is going to always, we're going to be this way for a long time. But we weren't. When you look at today's angst, there's a lot of uncivility. Um, and it, it, the uncivility in our culture is is to me, astounding. So we're dealing with a culture who are, in essence, non-believers. So we shouldn't be surprised. I certainly should not be surprised. But the level that it is, is, is still amazing. And it's at all levels of society. Uh, there is nothing dignified in our public. Nothing about the language. Nothing about the accusations. Nothing about the motives. And it has, um, I don't know what to think. And I guess I do have a thought, is that I'm not so sure that, that we weren't civil back in 2001. I don't think that civility was real. It may have been real for a short term. Because it was a shock to the system. And second, of all times to cause a, a trouble on a plane ride, even complaining to a flight attendant or a gate agent, that was not the time. Because there's nobody was putting up with that uh, from a legal perspective. You know? So there was a motive to be civil. But yet, here's what I think. I think that for us as believers, the society stresses or its unification is not our motive to behave a certain way. We do not reflect society. We should not reflect it. We should not mirror the world. And we do. And we, and we do at all levels. So I surely did not, I guess I did, I made notes. To get really sidetracked, sidetracked on 9/11, uh, but we reflect and should always reflect, regardless of the uncivility of society, the civility of our Lord. He put up with much more than we did, and he did it with much more grace. And so, if he did, we can. Because there's really, you're not going to argue your way or reason your way into this discourse anymore. Reason it is not part of the discussion anymore. Only emotion and fury and rage. You know, let's stop. And let's certainly let's not amplify or, or support it. Let's see if we can't take the fire out of our conversation and put the love back into it. No one wants to be like the world. It's They will not want to be like us unless they see that we're different. Uh, talking scriptures, reading scriptures, 
are not going to answer answer this society. Only first, when they see the love that we have, and that love is real, will they realize that we have something good. Then the scriptures can become very effective in someone who's willing to believe them. So, having said that, I have um, an intro, a different topic, and not typically something I've done. I've taught a little bit of this back in February before COVID for most of y'all began watching this. So I'm going to do something like it again, but with a slightly different twist. And I want to talk about financial management. And I know it doesn't have much to do with 9-11, and it's not meant to. So financial management. So if you thought about it, consider this. Think of a dozen parables. Just sit here, run through them in your head, their names. How many of them involve money? Parables of the talents, parable of the miner, the prodigal son, the foolish man who filled his barn, um, the shrewd servant, oh my, 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 um, the ungrateful servant, the woman who lost a coin. And quickly we can run through a lot of them. And how about those so-called teaching moments? Have you ever thought about those when Jesus saw something in a crowd or responded to something in a crowd and made a response to that? How many of those were about money? The woman who gave her last two coins. Uh, the man who came up and said, Lord, help me tell my brother to share the inheritance. Um, Jesus pulling a coin from a fish to pay his taxes. Um, he handed a coin and said, render to Caesar what is Caesar. There's a lot. And it is a dominating uh, plot. It's not necessarily the theme or the focus, but it's there in almost every explanation. And that's a curious thing. What the Bible says about money is fairly astounding. And so there are two or three reasons I think so. No, no scripture says this is a reason. Uh, so this is just an, a studied opinion for, for me to share. And that is, I think money is universal. We all understand. Only the most primitive of society who never had coinage would barter things. So I have a sheep. You have some pottery. Uh, I'll give you a sheet for for those large pots or that article of clothing for this or something like that. That's bartering. And that is, in essence, what we do with money, except we use a what we call a common form of uh, value. And so, because if you had a sheet and you wanted uh, some article of clothing and the person you come up to has wheat, you can find an equal exchange, but if you don't want wheat, uh, you're not going to make an exchange. You have to go find somebody who has an article of clothing to sell and desires a sheep. And if you can't find that person, it's tough to barter. What coinage gave is for everyone to exchange to a common value, and then you can use that to exchange with someone else, not having to find exactly the person who wants to buy what you're selling, and who wants to sell what you want to buy. So financing and money is common. It goes to our well-being. We labor to acquire. Um, and with it, we can buy things that we need, not just want, need. Food, clothing, shelter. And then some things we want, like a, a video game. Probably not real big back in the days of Abraham, but I'm sure if he had the time and the money, he would have bought one. So there's this common universal understanding. Also, money often defines other things, like how well you are. Um, no money, can't eat. Bad, bad things are about to happen. Uh, you become... Desperate, you become stressed, you can't you lose your, you increase your chance of not surviving, and on and on and on. Lots of money, lots of security. Um, so there's this idea of being secure and well. 
They also, it goes with money. And this is not something of our culture. It goes way, way back to the very beginning. And so when Jesus talks about money, he talks about something that we all understand. The other thing, and I think that, that is both universal and cross-cultural. It is not bound to any culture. Uh, it is not a Jewish thing. It's not a European, Asian, African, American, North American, South American, whatever thing. It, is, it transcends time and space. The only other thing that I think compares to it in transcending time and space is your time itself. We all understand life. With the exception of Adam and Eve, who possessed it for a short time, we all are born, come to this world knowing the end of space. We will soon know that we have an end. I don't know what my time is allotted. Um, on average, in this country, men live to 72 or 3 or something like that. Um, but that's only an average. Some live much less. Some live much more. But um, we do understand time, that we have life. And most of us understand, understand, and some of us act that we understand that, and some of us don't, that we have, that time is fixed. And that really, barring a self-inflicted wound, we don't really control it. We see a lot of teaching about time. And so when I look at these two things, I like I've said to other classes, and for you all I'll repeat here really quickly, and that I believe that God gave man four gifts. All four gifts are found in Genesis, and I'll quote them to it really quickly. And I think one man has been given his body, uh, his physical being, uh, and with it what is in his mind and in his ability, his gifts, and all that stuff that goes with it. So he has this person. That person, that body, belongs to that individual. To you, how that person be. Uh, God does not make you use your body in any certain way. Uh, he would like you to use your body in certain ways, but he does not require it. The second thing he gives is that body has time, which I just said. So you've got not only a body, but you've got a certain amount of time to do something with it as you choose. The, th the third thing he did, he gave Adam and Eve the garden and the world. He said, the world is yours. Uh, go and subdue it. It belongs to you. I equate that in our society to wealth. The, thing, the physical things that we can possess and own and manage. And the last thing he gave them was he's allowed them to eat of the tree. And so that's that constant date, you know, source of goodness. And to me, that's very much like an income. Uh, so it's your wealth, your income, your life, time, and your body are four things that God has given everyone. Not necessarily the same amount, not the same proportion, but you have something. The reason I mention that is because two very important parables uh, that you probably, probably well know. Let me repeat them. Uh, Luke chapter 19, I believe, uh, is the parable of the of the minas, and uh, it is, and uh, then Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, and these two parables look very similar, and for the brevity of time, I'll just sort of describe the two parables, and I'll specifically describe talents. In the parable of the talents, a man goes on a trip. The man has a large estate and has servants, people that work for him. He leaves each servant an amount of money. So talent is not gift or ability. Talent is silver. He leaves them money, differing amounts, and he says he'll be back. 
they are they take that money and one of them invests it and, and doubles it. They, uh, five to five to ten. One has two. He makes two more. And the third one had one and he hid it. And then the man returned. The king or the landowner returned and said, "What have you done?" And one of them said, "This is what I made with your money. I made more." And he congratulated them. Second man made more. He congratulated him. And the third one said, I was afraid and I hid it. Um, and he was uh, shockingly condemned. And what he had was taken from him and given to the one with, with five. That's a, so we've looked at that. And we, we, most of us have heard that parable for a long time. So what are talents? And so the answer is silver. But what does it really mean in the parable? And so what this parable means is that the man who is a landlord is God. He gives his servants, who are us, and not just those who say they're his servants, he gives all men, I think, I think, he means all people, gifts. And I think those gifts are his body, his life, his time, his wealth and his income. He goes away. And in the parable of talents, he does not say for how long, nor does he tell them. So if you were if you take it more to a physical thing, if you work for a man and he gave you a fifty bucks and said, I'll be back and we'll see what you've done, one thing you would ask is, when are you coming back? Right? Because if it's tomorrow, you would probably be very careful about doing something foolish with it. If it's in 20 years, you might just play with it for a while. And then somewhere around year 44, 48, begin to get serious about it, trying to make up time. Some of you just might put it to work the entire time and try to grow it. Now we all do things like that. And so when I think that the king does not tell you when he will return, I think that represents the fact that you don't know how long you have. So, what are you going to do with your body, with your time, with your money, and with your wealth? That's the question. Because those are all gifts, and you all, you we will all give account for what we did with those things. We have nothing else that gave that, that, that we have to account for. Nothing else. I think that's intriguing. So this is what I want to talk about with actual financial information. So this is going to be very short, and I also want to state very clearly. Um, that this is just my studied opinion. Nothing that I'm going to say I can hard in concrete verse scripture say is true. This is what I understand from scripture. I believe scripture says it. But if you say it's absolute, I'm not absolute. I offer it you for your consideration. For you to think about and to make a decision about does that by faith, you by faith and understanding agree. And he by faith do it. So this is how we'll start. If you were to say, I have a prioritized list of four spending objectives. And I want to go through them with you. But I have to start with an explanation. The parable, not a parable, but when Jesus saw the woman put the coins into the temple. And she gave more than all the people who put huge sums of cash in. It wasn't the amount of the cash that made her come so large. It was the significance to her life. That was all she had. It was her percentage that was so large. It was all. And I believe that most people uh, in churches, and probably most of you, believe that the number one priority is to give it to the Lord. And so I don't want to discount that. 
Uh -huh. I want to offer you another way to think about it. So yes, if you say, I'm going to give the first 5%, 10% to the Lord, you know what? If that's a faith decision, then we will. I will honor that and, and encourage you to do so. So that is a good thing. But here's what I would suggest to you do, is that if God owns it all, how do you give him any? And, and if he asks you to do certain things and you don't do them, instead you, quote, give it to the Lord, I'm not, I think we have some concerns. So I would tell you this. I believe that when you give it to the Lord, you do that when you use it the way he asks you to use it even if it's not, quote, in a church collection plate. So this is, this is how I get there. I like to read to you, I like to have four, number one, and in, and in order. Uh, I like to read to you a passage from Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. If you I'll give you a little bit, of course you can pause, you don't have to wait it out. Um, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. Um, I read the wrong verse. That's one I'm going to use later. Sorry about that. I apologize. I could start back and record it, but I like the awkwardness, so let's just keep that going. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 8. So, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 8. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first, these being the children or the grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who has who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give these give the people, that's the people the church is going to, give the people these instructions too, so that no one may be open to blame. If anyone listen. Verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And some other um, translations will actually say it's worse than an infidel. That's strong, strong language. And it's actually some of the strongest language about how to spend money in script, if not the strongest. So this is what I would tell you. I believe as a household, uh, your number one priority with your money is to care for your family and your extended family. If you're not feeding your children and you're putting money in the collection plate, I have great concerns. I have great concern. This is caveated by one understanding. And this is a very important understanding to it as well. What is taken care of? What is extent? And you know, it's not clear. Therefore, it's open to interpretation and understanding. Um, I would give you two things to consider. You should... They should all be fed. And, but there's this idea of needs and wants. And that line is really not the same for everybody. If you live in the United States, your needs are very, very high compared to most people in the world. Your needs, not your wants. Um, do we need a car? I, we would say yes. We, how do you get to work? How do you do these things? You know, the vast majority of the world does not, a large part of the world does not have such things. 
Is it a need? No. Your needs are much more basic. And so I don't want to get into a discussion, or and I certainly do not want to criticize, condemn, or state any line where that exists. But the, the cultural understanding of good money management is living within your means. But I tell you, the man who stored up great riches in his barn lived within his means, and he was condemned. You have to understand and determine where your needs and your wants lie. But it does include caring for your family. I think that's number one. Uh, I think this verse is strong enough to, to make me convinced that your first priority with your money is to care for your family. If you take assistance from someone else, uh, including the government, that's okay. That's nothing. There's no condemnation of that. But your first priority should be, with whatever you can, is to not live on your parents if you're an adult, not live on someone else if you can. That your first one should be to care for your own family, without having to care, have someone else help you care for them. To the point you can. That's number one. I do not say it's sinful to take help from others. If it were simple to take help from others, then God would tell us not to help others. But he does not say that. But you're, like I said, priority one, objective number one, will get to the point that you can care for your own household. Number two. This one is Romans. Oh, you have to read it. Romans chapter 13, um, verses 1 through 6. Um, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except for that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's tough to swallow sometimes, isn't it? Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Um, and we'll see here in the few years following this letter, that would really be tested. Um, it does not mean that the government is right. Okay. But here's, this is the principle to live by. Uh, for he is God's servant to do good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. Um, and on down to the end, verse 6, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time in governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Um, that one is a, a fairly strong. I don't think it goes quite as strong of a statement as the other one about you deny the faith and you're worse than an unbeliever. But this is pretty pretty adamant about your taxes. Jesus will say it himself. To render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So I think that when you read these together, um, along with 1 Corinthians 6, um, which I want to talk about here in a minute, is that paying taxes. And I think paying taxes is priority number two. So I want to read you 1 Corinthians 6. And this is basically a, this is going to be a principle that I'm going to extract. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment? Instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? That's certainly not a topic I'm going to address today. How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint judges, even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to the law, to law against another. And this in front of unbelievers. So I think there is a principle here 
that we should appear good and just and honorable to the world. We should pay our taxes. We should not have. This, we should not take our disputes in public. I think it's wrong to bring a brother out in the public and shame him. I think it's wrong to do that to a sister, whether it be on social media, whether it be publicly stated or any other form. If you're going to condemn a brother, shut up. Turn it off and think about this verse. We've got to stop that. We can't, it cannot go on. You will pay the price. I, believe, I fear for you when you do that, or when I do that. This idea of not shaming or not making the Lord look foolish in the world because we are his ambassadors. And if we look foolish, we make the Lord look foolish. We have shamed our own Lord. I think that's a driving principle throughout all scripture. And I also think that's the driving principle behind the taxes going. We don't want to be known as people who don't pay their taxes. Okay, and we not because of us, because we shame our Lord. Our Lord paid taxes. He had Peter pay the tax. Now he took a coin out of a fish, and I don't suggest you as a strategy to look for fish and coins, but it is a very strong case that Jesus paid his taxes. I think authority too. We should not shame the Lord by, by paying and pay your taxes. Number three, your second, your third objection is give it away. So Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, verse 23, uh, 28, I'm sorry. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So obviously, if you take the uh, First Timothy passage, to work your hands, the first thing you do is make sure that you can cover and account for your family. I put taxes in there a second, and then what you have left over after you've met your needs, your family's needs, you pay your taxes no more than you have to, the, the third objective is to share that money. So, could that be putting it in a collection plate at assembly time? Absolutely. When the primary use of our money is to, to, to support men and women who have dedicated their life to serve the Lord so that they don't have to spend time in employment, other employment, making money to live. That's how Paul got by. He did do some work. He told the Thessalonians he did. He worked making tents. But there are some who we have, we as a group, we as a congregation have said, you know, if this person is willing to serve full time, then we're willing to help cover their expenses. And that's what we do. When we have several uh, here that are, that are that way. That does not transition the work away from us. Should never do that. We just have less time because we are somehow engaged in making wages so we can support them. But we still have that responsibility to serve. And for those who have, are willing to take funds from us, they're our brothers and sisters. We are supporting them. And the, we will give them money. So that certainly is one way, but it's not the only way. If you had a neighbor or a friend, a lot of people in this congregation do things in secret. That's fine. They'll help a brother or sister out that we may know have fallen on the hard times. Or give them food, give them shelter, give them other things. Or you can just give it away through some other means. I think they're all fine. And I think they all fit this this model of the Ephesian letter to give it away. Those are my three problems. That is what I understand from Scripture. So I've given you the verses. I've given you the explanation. 
The scripture does not give you a list, one through three. He just doesn't do it. Nor does it say that this one's more important than what Paul said to the Ephesians. He never, nothing like that ever comes out. It is pure understanding on my part. I offered it to you for your consideration, but I think there's a fourth. This is the one that's probably the most shaky. And so I believe it, but I struggle with being absolutely sure that it's number four. And the, that fourth one is, I would put money away. You want to call it invest? So that one day when you're not able to work to support your family and to do those other three things, you have the ability to do so. So call that retirement investment. Uh, so that you can serve without having to labor for wages uh, to, to the past your ability to do so. So, that is an opinion. Uh, and I offer it for your consideration. So that is certainly a different type of lesson that I'm particularly used to teaching. Um, I believe that we've been given talent. And one of those is our money. Another one's our time. We could talk we can have the same discussion about time. Uh, a lot of people are love to trade off money for time. If I can make a big donation and not have to serve in any way and give any of my time, a lot of people are willing to do that. And some that's just what they need to do, and some that's what they prefer to do. I can make no judgment. And nor can I, nor will I. We all have to make our understanding the best we can. But remember, God knows the heart. He knows our motives. And we need to consider that. Number one, for goodness sake, work to, to account for your family. Pay your tax, uh, pay, take care of your family, meet their needs, and in the needs of your little larger family. And this one says grandparents and parents. Number two, pay your taxes. All of them don't cheat. Number three, Give what you can away. What's left or what? And number four, holding some to hold for your retirement so that when you're unable to work, unable or possibly unwilling, if you can dedicate more of your time to other things, then you can put some away so that you can sustain yourself after your ability to work is greatly decreased. Y'all have a good weekend. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Um, my Somebody's been texting me a lot. I don't know if you can hear my phone beeping away. But uh, we do intend to start classes. Uh, which ones and how many and what ages and where. That's all the things that we seek your input on. Please send a note to John. Uh, to myself, anyone else that's part of the Ophaser group, um, about your your thoughts. Would you come? Would you be willing to attend? And if if you're a teacher or were a teacher, would you be willing to teach to continue? And so the answer is not going to. We're not going to have them all. Uh, but I intend to teach, whether it's live uh, to a class or pre-recorded like we're doing now. Either way, I'm okay. So if you would give that response, it would help out a lot to move to, for us to be able to do what would be good for this congregation to, to meet each other and be with each other. And you have a great weekend. Take care. I love you.